Good afternoon and welcome to this third webinar in our series on real estate development in which we'll turn our attention to the financing of the transaction. I'm Colin Mackay, a partner on our finance and restructuring team based in our London office here at Shepherd and Wedderburn. Before I start, just a quick reminder of some of the usual housekeeping rules. Uh, to keep background noise to a minimum, we've placed each of you on mute. Uh, you can use the chat function throughout the presentation to post any questions that you might have, and I'll try to answer them at the end if we've got time. But please do include your email address when you're asking a question so that if I run out of time, I can respond by email after the webinar has finished. So let's get the ball rolling uh, with another look at a diagram that both Neil and Lynn used in the previous sessions. In the first session, Neil looked at the parts of this structure diagram highlighted in purple. So that is essentially the development agreement and the issues surrounding it. In the second session, Lynn uh, looked primarily at the construction issues highlighted red on the left-hand side of the diagram. And today, in the third and the final of our series, I'll be looking at those parts of the diagram highlighted in blue towards the top of the, this slide, uh, po essentially posing the question, where's all this money coming from to pay for all this development activity? Let's uh, begin by sketching out a few more specific details and picture of the sort of real estate development that we'll be talking about financing today, just to give us a bit of context. So first of all, uh, let's assume that there's some kind of special purpose vehicle, maybe a company, maybe it's some other form of legal entity like a limited liability partnership, which, uh, which whatever it is, has been established specifically and solely to carry out this development. Let's also assume the vehicle is onshore, to keep things simple. And that vehicle is at the very heart of the whole structure, entering into the development agreement with the landowner, entering into the building contract with the contractor. And in the context of the financing, as we'll see in today's session, the vehicle is also entering into the relevant finance documentation, for example, as a borrower under the loan agreement that we'll look at. Let's assume we're talking about an office development on a vacant site. Let's assume a substantial proportion of this new office space is being pre-let to a tenant with a strong credit rating. Now, the finance being used to fund the development, as ever, is a combination of equity and debt. The equity finance is being committed by two joint venture partners who have brought this whole development together. They are providing the equity finance almost wholly in the, the, the form of subordinated shareholder debt, but with a tiny proportion being share capital, um, assuming, assuming the vehicle is a company. The debt finance element uh, is being provided by way of a committed bilateral loan facility being made available by one of the main UK banks. So when I say committed, I mean that unlike an on-demand facility like an overdraft, the bank can only demand repayment before the scheduled repayment date if a default circumstance arises. The facility in question is being provided on a bilateral basis. In other words, there's only one bank making this facility available rather than a club or a syndicate of banks. And it's probably a term loan repayable, let's say, in two years, with that two-year term being fixed to allow a six-month period or a tail after practical completion, which let's assume is scheduled to occur uh, in 18 months' time. So this is purely development finance, which this bank is making available. In other words, it's all repayable at two-year point and does not convert into an investment facility at that stage. Let's also assume that the relevant bank is still quite relaxed about interest rates, doesn't expect them to rise uh, significantly over the next couple of years, and so is therefore not requiring any interest rate hedging. Um, and very broadly speaking, let, let's assume that this facility is being provided on, on, broadly speaking, normal senior debt commercial terms. 
So, for example, the entire principal amount of the facility is being repaid in a single bullet repayment at the end of the two-year term. In the meantime, interest will just capitalise or roll up. Uh, in other words, just get added to the principal amount of the loan. The interest rate is some margin, let's say 2.5% over LIBOR, which is, of course, the fluctuating component in the calculation of the interest rate. And the main financial covenant underpinning the financing is a 65% loan-to-cost covenant. So, uh, essentially, for every pound spent on development costs, the bank's facility is going to be available to fund 65 pence in that pound. Now, I specifically mentioned that 65% loan-to-cost covenant um, because there are lenders in the market today who will go much higher up the risk curve. 85% loan-to-cost is not unheard of. But, but the return that that sort of lender is looking for is, of course, predictably greater, and that often brings some slightly more unusual features into the deal and its structure, especially around fees and other payments to the, to, to the relevant bank or financier. Um, we are talking here about a reasonably typical uh, bank, bank financing, where the bank concerns bringing a reasonably normal risk appetite and receiving a, a, a commensurate, reasonably normal level of return by way of interest and fees. Now, in our imaginary deal, it's also been agreed that instead of all the equity finance being invested up front at the start, it's going to be invested in phases as the development progresses. The bank, understandably, had a, to work quite hard to get uh, comfortable with that, but um, it has done so, albeit it has a few requirements as, as a result, and one of them is a deferred equity guarantee. In other words, the bank has insisted that both the joint venture partners' parent companies provide a guarantee that as and when each time comes round for further equity investment in the SPV, the JV partners will indeed stump up their respective amounts of equity investment. And lastly, sketching in the, 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 the scene, the bank has also made it a term of the deal that those parent companies of the JV partners will provide a cost overrun guarantee to the bank. We'll maybe have a look at what that is in a little bit more detail later on, but essentially it's, it's what it sounds like. Now, as we go through today's session, I'll come back to a lot of these points I've just run through, so don't worry if, if some of that didn't make sense. I will try to elaborate on some of those points along the way, but hopefully, meantime, that gives us a little bit of context for the rest of this session. So here's the diagram showing how this financing structure is emerging. The borrower SPV company is right in the middle. The JV partners are investing the equity finance. A minimal amount of that equity finance is actual share capital in the SPV, and for tax reasons, the vast majority is going in as shareholder debt. Don't forget that equity finance is going to be invested in phases. The balance of the finance to, to, to fund the development will be the, coming under this term loan or senior loan to be made available by the bank and to be drawn down in stages through the course of the construction phase. The diagram shows over on the left the deferred equity guarantee I mentioned a, a moment ago uh, given by the JV partners parent companies and uh, over in the top right hand corner of the diagram also shows that cost overrun guarantee which the banks have required. Now through the life of the loan the bank will be relying heavily on this uh, creature mentioned down in the bottom right hand corner of the diagram, the, the, the project monitor. Uh, the project monitor, who is typically a quantity surveyor, basically provides independent advice to the bank on all aspects of the development as it progresses. So, for example, that project monitor will, will amongst other things, typically uh, sign off to the bank on borrower or SPV requests for drawdowns under the loan facility to fund development costs. And you'll also see in a couple of footnotes at the bottom of the diagram that we've mentioned that as part of this financing structure, the bank will of course be taking a security package which is made up of security over various assets held not only by the borrower SPV itself, but quite likely also some assets of the JV partners, most obviously their shareholdings in the borrower SPV. And we've also acknowledged that as an essential part of the structure, the shareholder debt that's made available by the JV partners has to be subordinated to the bank's term loan facility. So 
let's have a quick look at some of the main documents that are going to be generated by this financing of this development. There will be or there will have been a term sheet. That's the preliminary document, like a heads of terms, which is prepared by the bank and typically adjusted and agreed with the developer before the lawyers get let loose to generate the full suite of uh, financing documents. At the risk of stating the obvious, time spent by the parties up front discussing the term sheet thoroughly and reaching full agreement on its terms will help enormously in the subsequent full legal documentation phase. The facility agreement, which is the principal finance document, sets out all the terms on which the bank will make available that senior term loan. Increasingly, the market's using a template style of facility agreement made available by the Loan Market Association, or LMA. That, that template uh, is, is actually being created for use in a syndicated loan situation, but can be and often is stripped back to be used in bilateral deals too. So that's the LMA standard, which you'll hear the bankers referring to. And at 199 pages basic template, you'll find it's, uh, it's a cheeky little uh, bedtime read. Uh, we'll, we'll look at a few specific features of it in a few minutes. But just generally speaking for now, the, the, this template facility agreement contains a wide variety of options and variables on a number of important points and will require quite a lot of discussion and, and some negotiation. The security package to be taken by the bank will generate several documents. The borrower SPV will sign a document called a debenture, which uh, very broadly gives the bank various types of security over various types of assets owned by the SPV, including most obviously the site itself, SPV's rights under key documents in the deal, insurances, etc. The JV partners will typically both sign a share charge which gives the bank security over the shares in the SPV. The JV partners will also often give the bank security over the benefit of the subordinated loans they have advanced into the SPV. That's what we have called rather, rather uh, clumsily the subordinated creditors security agreement. I'm going to come back to collateral warranties separately in a couple of minutes, but for now let's just acknowledge that they are a key set of documents from the bank's perspective, uh, which amongst other things are designed to give the bank the ability to step in and procure the build out of the development if things go wrong during the scheduled construction phase. Uh, uh, now, I'm going to ignore for today's purposes a, 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 a recent alternative to collateral warranties called third party rights. And of course, in this deal, we have a couple of, the guarant of guarantee documents. There's the deferred equity guarantee we talked about, where the guarantors are giving comfort to the SPV that as and when a further amount of equity finance is to be invested, the GV partners will indeed fulfill those obligations to invest. And there's the cost overrun guarantee. Uh, under which the, the, the guarantors are giving the bank comfort that if the costs to complete are overrunning original expectations, the cost overrun will be funded. And frequently that cost overrun guarantee will, will make provision for how the cost overrun will be funded. For example, some injection of, of further subordinated debt. And let's not forget the subordination deed. Uh, that's a document that the bank the SPV and the JV partners as subordinated lenders will all sign to achieve the required subordination of the sub shareholder debt <coughs> excuse me, to the, to, the, to the bank's senior term loan. So that document, for example, will typically provide that unless and until the bank's senior term loan has been repaid, the SPV will not be permitted to repay any of the shareholder debt or pay any interest on it, uh, etc. And the JV partners will accept that they cannot demand repayment uh, of that shareholder debt or pursue the SPV in any respect in relation to it. So those are the main documents generated by this deal. But, but there are, of course, a wide variety of other documents which might be part of any other deal structure. For example, you often see different types of guarantee, completion guarantees, interest shortfall guarantees even sometimes straight financial guarantees of, the, of, of some or all of the loan itself. They all may be part of the deal. And don't forget that there's no hedging of the interest rate in our imaginary deal. 
but where there are uh, hedging arrangements, or maybe perhaps most likely imposed by the bank, then then that brings a, a, a whole additional set of documentation. Let's now talk about this main document, the facility agreement, for a few minutes. Different lenders have different attitudes and requirements, and in some cases preferred template documents when they finance a development. But the LNA template is steadily being used more and more in the market. And as I mentioned earlier, it's pretty comprehensive. And summarizing it in just two or three minutes is quite challenging, to, to, to say the least. So instead, what I'm going to do is, working from the LMA template, just pick a few reasonably prominent features of the document which are reasonably specific to a real estate development finance deal, just to give you a bit of, of, of an insight. So the first uh, feature which I've uh, brought up on the screen is budgeted costs. Um, budgeted cost is a concept in the LMA document which underpins the whole facility agreement and indeed the whole of suite of finance documents generally. We're talking here about the base set of numbers prepared by or, 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 or on behalf of the developer in any development of any scale. They may not always be called budgeted costs. That's just a defined term the LMA document happens to use development appraisal, cash flows, there, there are various different terms which might get used, but typically we're talking about a spreadsheet which itemizes all the anticipated costs and expenses of the development, often also with sources and applications of funding itemized as well. And this set of numbers is used in a wide variety of different contexts within the facility agreement. For example, I've, I've mentioned two or three on the slide here, for example, the purpose clause, the clause which spells out what, what the loan facility is being made available for. That, that purpose clause provides typically that the SPV can only apply the sums borrowed under the facility towards payment of budgeted costs. The cost overruns rules in the facility agreement are based on the details in the, in the budgeted costs. When the, when the loan to cost covenant is, is tested, the budgeted costs feature in that process and so on. And, 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 and of course, before the deal starts and money is drawn down under the bank facility, this set of numbers will need to be finalised and agreed with the bank. And, and, and as a practical point, it's always worth checking that this spreadsheet or, the, or these numbers fits with the facility agreement in the sense that it provides all the information and performs all the functions that the facility agreement requires of it. Any development finance facility, including the LMA standard, will have at least reasonably detailed provisions on the mechanics surrounding drawdown. The SPV wants to pay development costs by drawing under the facility. The bank wants to be comfortable it's appropriate to advance the drawdown requested. And the relevant provisions uh, contained in the LMA document involve uh, the supply to the bank not only of the relevant uh, drawdown or utilization request, but, but, but also um, various supporting pieces of documentation, invoices, etc. Uh, a, a certificate, typically from the employer's agent on behalf of the SPV, and a sign-off, a certification of sign-off from the bank's project monitor, confirming it's uh, comfortable the drawdown should go ahead. Now, it doesn't always happen, but it's a good idea to make sure that all concerned in that process have seen and understand the relevant provisions in the facility agreement to make sure everyone knows the role that's expected of them. Amongst the many restrictions imposed by the bank through the terms of the facility agreement, there are various categories of undertakings given by the SPV. Amongst those, it's always worth the SPV focusing in particular on the so-called development or, and, and also property undertakings, which are just what they sound like, a series of undertakings designed to impose upon the SPV the bank's requirements as to how the development should progress through to practical completion. These development undertakings are quite extensive and far-reaching. By, by, by way of example, I've, I've mentioned uh, required completion date. That, 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 that will be an undertaking by the borrower SPV that it will hit practical completion by a specified hard date. Missing that specified hard date 
can ultimately lead to the sort of default circumstance in which the bank is allowed to uh, demand immediate repayment of the sums already borrowed by the SPV. So quite significant. The, 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 there will be development undertakings in relation to the contractor and the consultants. Uh, the, the, those undertakings will, for example, dictate which members of the construction team are to provide collateral warranties to the bank. That's often a source of some discussion um, from, from the SPV's perspective. I've also mentioned insurances. Um, this is a, insurance is a specialist area. The banks will typically have quite specific requirements of the contractors, all risks covered during the construction phase, and then other cover beyond PC. Um, it's an area which can, which can get quite technical and problematic, and getting insurance brokers and advisors focused on the topic early is always a good idea, hopefully to avoid any painful or prolonged discussions or difficulties. Um, uh, in practice, we are seeing a little bit of an increased focus by the banks on, on getting the insurance arrangements entirely to their satisfaction. So these and numerous other development undertakings really do need to be looked at quite carefully from, from the SPV's perspective. I'm now running right up against time, so I'm going to deal with this last slide on the bank security package quite quickly before we finish. Question, what are the SPV's assets available for the bank to take security over? Answer, an undeveloped or a partially developed site, some rights under some contracts, maybe some insurances, and, and, and that's really about it. So the bank will take security over those available assets. But if at any stage in the construction phase, up to or towards the back end of the construction phase, if not quite up to PC, the scheme runs into difficulties, and, and, and the bank's perhaps got some default circumstances on its hands. Let's imagine uh, an extreme example that the SPV itself has actually become insolvent. Then there is realistically uh, unlikely to be enough value in those, sec those secured assets to cover the bank's exposure or, or to give it an exit by enforcing its security and selling the, 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 the assets, including the, well, most obviously the partially developed site. In fact, enforcing its security um, and, and selling or trying to sell the assets may well be the very worst course of action the bank could take to achieve value. So the bank needs to go into the deal and start lending under the facility with some ability, if and when it encounters default circumstances, to manage the SPV and the development through to a point where there is enough value in the developed asset to give the bank the possibility of a more satisfactory exit, whether through a forced sale or refinancing or, or, or whatever. The, the, the bank needs the ability to build out and to get to PC and along the way, going back to our imaginary deal, preserve the benefit of that valuable agreement for lease with that tenant, which is one of the commercial underpins to the whole deal. And the way the bank obtains that right is of course through step-in rights in relation to each and every one of the key contracts in this in this development deal. The bank needs to be able uh, to, to, to say to all the key members of the construction team and the pr prospective tenant, we know this SPV insolvency gives you the right to terminate your contract with the SPV and walk away, but we're exercising our step-in right to keep you involved and performing your role regardless of that SPV insolvency. So coming back to the SPV's assets briefly as, as, as we finish, the bank will take a, a legal mortgage over the site. It will probably take security over the SPV's key contractual rights under all the, the, the key construction contracts and the agreement for lease. The bank will take security over the SPV's insurances, all probably via the debenture document I mentioned earlier. And the bank will probably take share charges from, from, from the JV partners 
uh, and also security over their rights as subordinated lenders. And that's all relatively straightforward and in some respects not a million miles away from how the bank might approach the security package in a real estate investment deal. But the need for the step-in rights is quite different from that in investment finance approach. And that need for step-in rights means that in shaping and taking its security package to, to include these step-in rights, the bank and its advisors are very definitely going to be looking at all the development and the construction documents and asking themselves which of these does the bank need to be able to step into. And once it's agreed the bank needs a step-in right in relation to a particular document, then the next question is how or by which document will the bank achieve that step-in right? And in the case of construction documents especially, it's, it's, it's often this document called a collateral warranty given by, by the relevant construction team member, which includes or confers on the bank this step-in right which it requires. But I'm now really running up against time, and I've hopefully in any event already drawn out the main point here, which is that in shaping its security package, the bank will not just be relying on the available assets of the SPV and the JV partners, but will be delving right down into the matrix of development and construction documents and requiring a suite of step-in rights from a potentially wide variety of the organisations playing a role in this wider development deal. And in practice, the extent of that suite of step-in rights required by the bank, their terms and the timing of their delivery can all be the subject of quite a lot of debate between the bank and the SPV. I am going to finish there as we are pretty much out of time.